Ladies and gentlemen, now we're joined by Mr. Cliff Rissman, Foley and Lardner. He is out of their Dallas office and he's a partner and co-chair with the hospitality industry team. Cliff is not only a veteran real estate lawyer who represents companies that develop, own, operate, finance, hotels and resorts around the world, but he's also a frequent speaker at our programs and is always backed by popular demand. As you can see, he's, he's quite a likable fellow if you listen to our conversation. <laughs> and the, the clients and chambers actually describe him as not only practical, always accessible. And what, what you don't see there is how amiable and just such a kind person that he is. And ladies and gentlemen, trust me when I tell you, when he's finished, it's like you're getting a master's degree in this subject. So we're always fortunate to have Cliff share his time and insight with us. Please welcome Cliff Rissman to talk to us about management agreements now that we're coming out of COVID. Cliff, take it away. Thank you, Stephen, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, you know, as I mentioned to Stephen before, uh, he's been kind enough to invite me to give this presentation for more years than, than I can remember or want to remember, but I do think it is, it is unique this year and will be very different. Um, you know, historically, I've spent 10 or 15 minutes kind of giving management agreement 101, and, and this has been such a unique year with, with the pandemic and its effects on the hospitality industry, in particular, the cash crisis that the vast, vast majority of, of hospitality owners and assets have experienced, whether it be complete closures, remaining open with, with single digit occupancy or occupancy in the teens, um, layoffs, furloughs of employees, dealing with uh, cost cutting on one side of the equation, PPP and other types of funding on the other side. What I really want to do is talk briefly about the effects that the last year has had on the owner-manager relationship and on, on likely effects, I think, that it will have on management contracts going forward next slide please very very briefly as as we always talked about the 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 owner operator relationship typically in the united states is by way of a management agreement where where the operator receives fees base incentive cost reimbursements we'll talk about that a little later but the benefits and burdens of of the of the operation end up resting with ownership, as opposed to a lease structure, which you see from time to time in the States, but more often in uh, overseas. Um, what has happened this year, whether it's a management contract or a lease, we, we've seen fees or rent not being paid. We've seen it being partially paid. We've seen forbearance at times by the recipient. And, and this is all still being sorted out, you know, for some time, kind of the buzzwords where people were playing nice in the sandbox. Um, but the day of reckoning has come for some and, and, and will be coming for others. There, there'll be defaults under these contracts. There'll be past due fees converted to, to debt. There'll be some forgiveness, a lot of restructuring. But really, this is this is playing out right before our eyes. Next slide, please. And in the context of the relationship and, and getting new deals, you know, we often see operators, managers using their balance sheet, whether it be by way of key money, whether it be an equity investment in the counterparty, uh, debt, oftentimes subordinate or some type of uh, performance or operating deficit guarantee, but the buzzword not only always has been, but more and more is becoming, how do these parties have, have better alignment? Next slide, please. Be, be, because historically, the fee structures we touched on briefly before, you've got base fees coming off the top 
out, out of gross revenue in a franchise context. It might be gross room revenue, but somebody's taking something off the top, regardless of the performance of the asset. It's oftentimes coupled with an incentive fee and there may be more alignment in terms of incentive because it's usually based on sometimes a percentage of GOP, sometimes a percentage of EBITDA less reserves, which is essentially the equivalent of real estate NOI. Many times it's a percentage of the amount over a hurdle, it might be a return on cost or return on investment, but there's more alignment in the incentive fee context than the base fee. And, and so the question has become, what are people doing about that today? You've got assets closed or that have been closed. There's been zero gross revenue. You've got assets operating with such low occupancy that gross revenue is, is such a small percentage of what the parties anticipated. What I think you will see more and more of going forward as a result of folks having gone through this is some minimum fee that is not tied to gross revenue. It may be a fixed dollar amount per month, per year. It may be the greater of that amount or a percentage of gross revenue, but we see more and more folks talking about that. Next slide, please. Um, we always talk during these pre this presentation about termination issues, whether it's with cause, without cause, performance tests, term on sale. Uh, there's, I don't wanna get into that per se today because of time limitations, but there are two things I wanna talk about. One is franchise conversion. We see more and more agreements where the owner has the right at some point in time or based on some trigger to convert a management contract to a franchise agreement such that the brand is no longer going to be the manager. A third party manager will be brought in, but the brand keeps the flag. Um, I think you will continue to see more and more of that in different situations. The other thing that I think is really interesting in the context of termination is the trailing 12 operating results or the fiscal 2020 operating results. If you think about how often some formula brings that into play, whether it's wow. calculating liquidated damages, whether it's calculating a termination fee, uh, whether it's in the context of a performance test cure, People are looking to prior operating results. And I haven't seen this litigated yet, but I suspect we will. And when someone pulls the plug and terminates an agreement and says, we were closed 11 months of 2020, so uh, the, the, the gross revenue was X, which leads to a, a management fee of Y, which is so much less than what the parties contemplated would be the case in the context of working through that termination payment formula, I think a lot of owners may try and take advantage of that. Use this time frame. I think someone's got a live mic on. Uh, I hear some noise. Anyway, I, 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 and, and what the other party's response to that, whether it's an equitable argument that that's not what was complicated, but contemplated by the parties, I don't know, but I think that will be a big issue in the year to come. Next slide, please. Uh, we're almost out of time. I, I just want to talk a little bit about financing matters. Everybody's been pulling SNDAs out of the drawer, seeing what has been documented in terms of the relationship and the obligations between the lender and the manager, particularly as it becomes to as it comes to control of cash. We, we've seen a lot of things happen due to COVID, people deferring CapEx projects, brands waiving or their brand standards and deferring compliance, costs related to new cleanliness standards, people dipping into their reserves, which at some point will need to be replenished. Next slide, please. Uh, we're about out of time. One thing I wanna talk about is employment related and it's the struggle that a lot of our clients have been having getting employees back to work. I mean, it's not really 
this topic, but folks have been laid, laid off. They've been furloughed. They've been collecting unemployment, supplemental unemployment. A lot of our clients are saying we can't rehire. We can't get people back to work because, frankly, a lot of folks have figured out without getting into your politics, right, wrong, or indifferent, they're making as much or more money sitting home collecting unemployment and supplemental employment as they used to collect going to work every day. I think that will continue to be a struggle. Uh, with that, I see we're out of time. I thank you all very much. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has, and I'll turn it back over to Stephen. Hey, Cliff. Thank you. I, I, I want to get into a couple of things. Taylor, though, can we can we put his last slide back up? Uh, I, I want to ask a question while we're getting that slide pop back up, Cliff. But, you know, we see a lot in these management agreements where sometimes the owner reserves the right to veto key personnel. You, you're familiar with the concept. Absolutely, right? absolutely. Right. So, so here, when we talk about joint employer, right, and we talk about the owner trying to stay out of litigation, you know how that happens. My experience has been, though, that plaintiff's lawyers will typically use that key personnel provision in the management agreement to try to demonstrate owners continuing to have control over day to day. So how, how do you balance that, particularly with the scrutiny today around joint employer and what we think is going to be even more with the current administration? That's, that's an excellent question, Stephen. I mean, historically, and, and I'm by no means a labor lawyer, but as a hotel management contract lawyer, I've kind of a jack of all trades. So I know enough about the labor issues to be dangerous, but the balance has typically been that there will be a short list, sometimes as short as the general manager. Uh, sometimes it will pick up the most senior finance person. Every asset's a little different. If an asset relies heavily on its F and B operations, their cache, their contribution to revenue. You might see the most senior F and B person. You might see an executive chef. But let's say somewhere between one at one end of the spectrum and four and five at the other. My general understanding is an owner has not gotten in the soup, for lack of a better term, from a joint employer liability perspective, having the ability to approve candidates for those positions. They're, they're not going out and trying to find them. They're being put forth by the manager subject to some detailed owner approval mechanics. Perhaps the owner has to act within a certain time, has to be reasonable, can't disapprove more than two or three for any one opening. That generally has been acceptable. At the other end of the spectrum, the owners know that they cannot dictate the termination of those employees because that would put them in a problematic space. So you'll often see language about consultation, about concerns that an owner might have. But typically, the, the balance is the owner gets some reasonable approval of certain key employees Every other employment decision rests with the manager, and and that's that's where I think the state of play is. Very helpful. Thanks for that. I, I want to give you some more time, Cliff, to talk about force majeure oh, okay. and, and, and what your thoughts are in terms of you know looking back and looking ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I I, I think I've said this before. Many of us have spent more time over the last year reading and thinking about force majeure clauses than we have in the first part of our, in my case, the first 36 years of my career. Okay? <laughs> so, and, and they're all different and they're all unique. And we see a lot of cases reported and things across the board. This has typically not come up so much in the context 
of the owner-manager relationship, but more in the context of the hotel's relationship with its guests and in particular group business. Um, there have I, I've had dozens and dozens of calls of, of, from both sides about meeting cancellation, group business cancellation. Does force majeure apply? And 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 my first response is, can you please send me the provision so I can see what it says? Because they're all different. And 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 some are very detailed and have been very specific and not only talk about acts of God and, and pandemic, but have gotten into government mandated closures and restrictions. Those are really good from, from the perspective of the party trying to claim force majeure. The very generic ones uh, have, have not been as good for the party trying to claim force majeure. Um, I think force majeure clauses will be very different going forward. We already see paragraphs that have been crafted specifically to deal with COVID-19 and, and similar situations that may occur in, in the future. Now, the practical side of all of these discussions has been, in my experience, 90 some odd percent of the time, the parties yeah, they look at these provisions, they see what they can use for leverage, but these things have been getting resolved on a business basis, whether it's, no, I'm not going to charge you liquidated damages, but I'm not going to refund the deposit I'm holding, or whether it's, uh, are you going to come back next year when everything's okay, and if so, We'll roll your deposit, but we're not going to charge you a pet. I mean, people have been resolving these the right way in a business manner. Yes, there's been some litigation, but generally speaking, going back to something I said before, for the most part, the parties have played dice in the sandbox. Yeah, and, and look, to, in that regard, we have seen a lot of that on the meeting side. But for the audience, have, have you actually seen force majeure um, kind of leverage conversations between managers and owners in terms of relieving some responsibility? Or for that matter, Cliff, have you seen it in conversations between the franchise or the franchisee, you know, trying to um, alleviate some of the fees that might be due? Is, is that also been well, going on? I, I, I generally speaking the force majeure provisions in management contracts and franchise agreements carve out the payment of money and the ability to pay money so it's not as often brought up but i do think now that people have good 2020 numbers and and things like performance provisions and performance tests are being looked at after last year's numbers. Typically, a well-drafted performance test from the perspective of an operator will have some sort of equitable adjustment mechanic for things such as force majeure. So I think that's the place you are likely to see it more than in the default, I didn't pay you because of force majeure, but in the context of a, of a performance termination provision, where rightly so, in fairness, the operator is going to seek equitable adjustment of that test as a result of a force majeure event, such as the pandemic. Okay, so it's there, just not as applicable as we're seeing it in the meeting space. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I will also say, you know, depending who drafted the agreement, who was involved in negotiating it for performance tests, you know, typically an operator's first shot out of the box with their agreement is if there's a force majeure event, performance is excused. Mm -hmm. A more sophisticated agreement, or perhaps where, where the owner had more sophisticated 
uh, employees or counsel involved gets into equitable adjustment as opposed to excuse. So, uh, but, but by, by way of a quick example, let's just pick something. You're, you got a hotel in Cancun and, and, and they close the airport, okay? Well, if the test is excused, whether you failed is the only question, not by how much and that failure is excused. If the agreement provides for some sort of equitable adjustment mechanic, you have to dig deeper and say, okay, the airport was closed for three weeks. Um, we're measuring uh, GOP in the performance test. The airport closure, and look, this if this is going to get arbitrated, there's going to be experts, but someone's going to con conclude how much GOP was lost as a result of that airport closure. And let's hypothetically say it was $400,000. Well, if you failed that test by 300 and the airport closure, the, the, the force majeure event cost you 400, equitable adjustment means you failed the test. If you failed that test by 600, but the airport closure cost you 400, even after equitable adjustment, you still failed the test. So that's the difference between performance being excused versus equitably adjusted. Got it. Yeah, that's an interesting approach for sure. And I could see that happening on the meeting event side as well. Um, sounds like you need to do a webinar on that concept. <laughs> so I want to remind the audience that you can chime in, just unmute, or you can send a question through the chat. We'll, we're monitoring that. But Cliff, while we're looking to wait for those, you know, one of the big, not necessarily fights, but negotiating points for many years now has been who owns the customer data? Has that been pretty solved in everybody's book? And is it leaning toward the management company because it's their customers? How are you seeing that dealt with? Well, I my personal opinion is there's a dichotomy between the brands and the non-branded or independent managers. I think as a business matter in branded agreements, the industry has kind of settled on the brand owns those customers, but information about those customers is should be and is generally licensed to ownership for use in connection with their hotel during the term of the agreement. Then you get into what happens on termination and which components of that basket of customer information should and or is turned over to the owner for use by the owner after that manager and brand is gone. And, and I think there's less settled uh, unanimity on that point, what they get, and what they don't get. Now, if you look at non-branded circumstances, yeah, I think, Look, a lot of the larger non-branded management companies have, have, have different programs in place where they capture some customers on some sort of basis. But I think generally speaking, they are far more agreeable to acknowledging that those customers belong to the hotel because that manager is not a brand. But one size clearly does, does not fit all. And, and obviously, the, the, the big challenge there are with the, uh, the meeting planners, right? The, 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 the company, the, the events, the groups, right? I mean, the transient traveler is one piece of information. But those relationships with the people that bring the large numbers, what, what are you seeing there? I, I, that's one of the items you were talking about, I'm sure, that, you know, that how do we, how, how are you seeing that dealt with? Cause there's, that's, that's enormous money, right? Well, it, it, it is. The interesting thing is there just hadn't been that much of it the last year. Obviously. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I mean, look, group business has <laughs> been hit the hardest 
if you look at the the, the spectrum of customers that, that use a hotel, you know, transient comes back, F and B comes back when the restaurant opens. Group bookings part for, for I think three reasons. One being just the corporate psyche of of those customers whether how when and if they're ready to tell their employees it's time to travel and gather in a group again for our annual meeting or our sales rewards event or whatever it is that's one part of it the second part is just the long lead time that it takes to plan and host those events and and the third part is even where hotels have opened back up, restaurants have opened back up, um, uh, you know, travel has started again. There are still a fair number of jurisdictions where large gatherings are still not permitted. So it, it, there just hadn't been that much of it. But in terms of who owns that group customer, I really think it fits it fits along the lines I said before. I mean, the brands will tell you that's their group sales and marketing. That's their customer. But look, at the end of the day, subject to what the economic arrangement is as to what that branded manager gets paid for bringing that group to that hotel at that point in time subject to that it, it, it it's a little bit of a toothless tiger in my book because every hotel owner who's got a decent asset manager knows which groups have been there and how to find them just like every manager <laughs> he has relationships with them it's a little harder to track down john smith who stayed in room 17 one night <laughs> and it is if you had a huge piece of group business everybody kind of knows who they are where they came from and how to find them yeah you know that's a very fair point today with linkedin etc it's not like it, discovering those people again is difficult a toothless tiger that's good i still wouldn't want to be in the ring with them but okay well cliff can we transition for a minute and it kind of the same question regarding employees right what, what are we seeing or what do you think we'll see in terms of generally speaking they work for the management company right but the, you know, the, the owner still wants that, those key relationships. What are you seeing there? Well, once again, on, on the labor side, you know, I think the biggest challenge, as I mentioned, is, is getting folks back to work. I, 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 I do think, and I'm getting a little far afield potentially for, for who I suspect the audience today is, but I will mention the Mexican legislature just passed a a very significant law in mexico which essentially will turn on its head the traditional hotel staffing model in mexico for a variety of reasons primarily mandatory profit sharing virtually every hotel in mexico uh, regardless of who technically the employer was and it was usually the an owner affiliate if it was a U.S. manager doing business in Mexico, the employees were always lodged in a separate employment subsidiary for a number of reasons, but particular to, in essence, uh, evade the Mexican profit sharing requirements. And the Mexican legislature has just, subject to a few very specific exceptions, indicated that that structure is going to be unlawful in Mexico on a going forward basis. Now they have kind of changed the profit sharing cap, put some caps on it and whatnot to encourage people not to try and evade it any longer. But I do think for anybody who's doing business in Mexico, everybody's kind of scrambling, trying to figure out what to do with employment mechanics there. Uh, that would be the most noteworthy thing. Interesting. Yeah, we're going to have to see how all this plays out. Let me look at my list here. Oh, Cliff, you mentioned key money. Uh, and I, th this might not be a fair question to you because I know you actively represent, you know, a lot of different folks. But is there, what are you seeing in terms of amounts of key money? Is there a standard percentage? Is there, is it just totally a uh, all over the map, depending upon the deal, or do you, do you see some sort of formula that's utilized to establish that level? 
Well, generally speaking, it's 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 all over the map, but it's driven by leverage. How badly somebody wants a deal, how much competition they have, who else is willing to write a check to get it. Um, obviously, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And when key money is is put into a deal, and particularly as the amount increases, there are certain things that the the provider of those funds is going to want in trade. Uh, a long-term contract, something more akin to a no-cut contract. Um, but, and you certainly see more of it in the branded sector and more of it uh, in, the, in the luxury and upper upscale sector. But it, to me, that's all driven by, in essence, supply and demand and negotiating leverage. I mean, some brands will tell you, yeah, maybe it's X dollars a key, or they have that internal mechanic that they don't share, but I really think it's 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 across the board and just driven by leverage. Interesting. Now, okay, I'm going to wrap. I've got time for this question. I want to save time for this question because I, I remember all the conversations between you and Albert Pucciarelli around is the management company and an agent. Uh, of the owner. Can you give us the 101 because you explain it so well? And we have had a question come in the chat, so I want to get to that too. Okay, so the simplest explanation is that the law in the United States has been clear for quite some time, absent an outlier case here or there, that a hotel management contract is an agreement of agency, no matter what you call it, no matter what you say in it. Um, and as a result, under the common law, a principal always has the legal right to terminate an agent, even if the agreement provides that it's not terminable. Now, that termination could be rightful and it could be wrongful. And if the agreement, the contract between the parties provides it's not terminable and, and the principal elects to exercise its common law right to terminate, it's wrongful. And there's a... And, there'll be a damage claim and a damage remedy that'll have to be calculated. But at the end of the day, in the United States, subject to an exception I'll get to in a moment, in one exception I'll get to in a moment, these are agreements of agency, they're terminable, no branded management company likes to hear it, some of them are my clients, but they can't go to court and have seek an affirmative injunction that they have a right to manage a hotel when the owner wants them removed. Now, the one most common exception is what's called an agency coupled with an interest, which is not terminable in the manner I discussed. And to have an agency coupled with an interest, you need three things. You need to have the agent make an investment in the principal. The investment has to be not insubstantial, whatever that means. It must be, the parties must be identical, the principal and the agent, and the investment's got to be made or committed to be made at the time that the agency agreement is entered into. Basically, if you put key money in and it's not an insubstantial amount and it's funded from the manager to the owner, as part and parcel of the bargain to enter into the contract, that's an agency coupled with an interest in what I said at the beginning of this monologue about termination being available, whether it's rightful or wrongful, would not apply. Wow. Yeah. That, that's, that's like, I remember those nutshell books in law school. That was perfect. Thank well, you, you, could, you, could, you could do an hour on it, but that's the gist of it. Yeah. No, that was great. And look, we had a question come in and I want to get to it. The question was around uh, indemnification agreements in these, uh, or the indemnification clauses in these agreements. What are you seeing there? Are they still the same? Are they evolving? What, what are we seeing there? Um, I will say this in general. I'm going to give a two part answer because for those who aren't intimately familiar with it, generally speaking, a hotel oh, that are all over the map and they get negotiated, but generally speaking, a hotel management agreement provides that the owner indemnifies the manager for anything and everything about the hotel and its operation, save and accept 
things related to the, let's say, bad conduct of the manager and how you define bad conduct is the hotly contested issue. Is it their negligence? Is it their gross negligence? It's certainly their fraud. Then whose conduct are we looking at? Is it the company's? Is it the management company's senior executive team? Is it anyone on site? If it is, it's probably not the rank and file employees, but only the most senior members of the executive team. If anything, I think a lot of the managers have been pushing back harder to limit when the owner does not indemnify the manager. Uh, it used to be you could get the GM's conduct, you could get maybe some of the key executives' conduct if it if it was their gross negligence and how they hired, supervised the rank and file. I think if there is a pushback and there's movement along the continuum, it's to limiting that exception and and taking away some of the areas owners used to want to see the management company liable and not indemnified by the owner. Very helpful, as usual. Cliff, we're out of time, but thank you very much for joining us again. It's It's been my pleasure. And if anyone has any other questions, you can feel free to reach out to me directly. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, yeah I absolutely strongly encourage you to reach out to Cliff Taylor. If we can put that CLE survey up for folks, they definitely deserve credit for, for all of these. And so, Let's make sure we get that done. But ladies and gentlemen, just to be absolutely clear, if you don't have Cliff Risman on your team, it's kind of like carrying a knife to a gunfight. So I, I'd encourage you to, to reach out to Cliff with your questions. They're just, I've come across very few people in, in the world, quite frankly, certainly in the US that have his depth of knowledge, not just the relationships, but the industry itself. I'll, I'm gonna share this story again. I, I, uh, to embarrass Cliff because he's very humble, but I was in a conversation with time with Jeff Holdaway, uh, former uh, counsel with uh, Marriott, of course, who also was a thought leader and expert in this space. And I remember in the middle of the conversation, Jeff stopped it and he asked everybody, he said, let's find out what Cliff Risman thinks, uh, because that's how uh, highly he valued Cliff's opinion in this space. So there you go. Thanks for joining us uh, for this presentation.